One might say that the association between the ostre and bunnies is off by a hair. There's a lot of um, stink, you might say, over the yoinking of Easter by Christians from surrounding pagans. And like Yule, you might be able to say this about some practices, but broadly, it does seem to be an overstated claim. But one of the things that is very much pagan is the name of the holiday, Easter, taken from the Anglo-Saxon Eostre, linguistically related to the German Ostara. But, unfortunately, the details of the nature of Eostre are largely lost. You'll find that this is often the theme with Anglo-Saxon heathenry, where the process of reconstruction is largely built through the examination of language and the subtleties of implied practice by looking at what is forbidden by Christian law. Some Anglo-Saxon sources might include leech books, early Christian magical manuals that contain what are likely heathen rituals with the names of the gods replaced with Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit, or various angels. Such is the case with Eostre, a goddess about whom we only have a single record, which is that of the Venerable Bede, a monk and historian residing in Northumbria. Bede was a prolific writer and a keeper of odd knowledge. His records are extremely useful to those exploring Anglo-Saxon heathenry, and this particular record comes from Bede's The Reckoning of Time. Now, in this text... Bede lists the various months, and he cites the month of March as Hrethmonoth, named for the goddess Hretha, to whom would be sacrificed at this time. He then lists April as Eostermonoth, which bears the name of the goddess Eostre, and he states that during this month there would be feasts in honor of the goddess Eostre. And Bede continues to say that this is the name of the Paschal month, but that the celebrations continue under the name of this older tradition, Eostre. And then the Venerable Bede, in all of his verbose knowledge, goes into immaculate detail of the... Su Actually, he doesn't. Uh, that's all he writes. Bede was a Christian who was later canonized as a saint. So we have to consider the source a little here. While Bede was obviously very knowledgeable of the past, he was selective about what he thought was worthy of recording. He was well familiar with the power of the written word and had no intention of immortalizing heathen practices through describing them by his hand. So he took pains to minimally discuss anything pagan. Now, in, in the rest of the text... Bede goes on about the minute details of things. It's easy to imagine that he was very familiar with the nuances of pagan belief extending into the past, at least as far as what was available to him at the time of his writing. But we can take the time to resent him for what he didn't write, while at the same time praising him for what he did. Despite his efforts, he alone is responsible for the preservation of the goddess Eostre and Hretha, even if all he preserved was their names. These names are discussed at length by Jacob Grimm of the Brothers Grimm fame, interestingly enough, and one half of the responsible party for the Grimm's fairy tales. In his book, Teutonic Mythology, he dives into the meaning of the name Hretha, which is essentially Gloria, from which we might get an image of a shining goddess of renown. But despite this clue and the clear centrality of her noted celebration in the month of March, there are no other clues. <laughs> with, with this goddess, we largely reach a dead end. With Eostre, however, there's a little more information and a trail that we can investigate. Now, Grimm notes that the same month of Eostre Manoth in German is Ostermanoth. And he denotes from this linguistic observation that Eostre may have been worshipped among the Germans as Ostara. He also connects this word to the East, noting a Norse masculine spirit of a similar name, a dwarf named Ostri, is associated with the East, who he decided may be a masculinized form of this tradition. Now, Grimm takes a historical leap here, and he notes that a feminine version of that name would be Ostra, fitting in nicely with Eostre and Ostara. Something to note here is the reason why this leap is taken. Grimm was a nationalist, and he was trying to develop a German-centric mythology. This was a trend at the time of the nation-state, and that people were developing work around mythology that was consistent with their view of the nation-state. 
The English were doing this with uh, Druidry, for example. It's a point of bias that should always be noted when going through sources written during this period. So this is why Grimm jumps to Ostara, a German form of Eostre, and why he tries to suggest that Ostri, a dwarf holding up the sky and associated with the East, might be some Norse masculinized version of Ostara. He wants an ethnically united canon for German mythology. And he wasn't the first nor the last person to try this, but as we've discussed in depth on this channel before, the heathen world was one of broad variety with different iterations varying greatly depending on place and time. Eostre and Ostara can easily be considered related without some Norse equivalent. The linguistic connection between Eostre and Ostara, however, is reasonable, and Grimm discusses that this linguistic analysis can conclude that Eostre may have been a radiant goddess of the dawn, as spring is the return of the dawn, as the days lengthen and the sun rises earlier in the east, particularly noticeable in April, after the equinox and spring is settling in. And Grimm notes that bonfires were lit around this time, which may have been associated with the worship and celebration of Eostre. Now, there have been some rather odd notions in the modern practice around Eostre that don't quite match up with history. They're not necessarily wrong. Practices evolve all the time. They did in history, and they do today. However, if one wants to align their practice with Eostre up with history, there's plenty of room for creativity in that practice, but there are a few things to consider. So, one of the things that's done in modern practice is the placement of Eostre or Ostara's celebration or festival on the equinox. Now, this would not align with a historical practice because of Bede's placement of her celebration in the Anglo-Saxon month of Eostermanoth and Grimm's alignment with Ostermanoth, which are April. Now, since the equinox is in March... If one were to celebrate an Anglo-Saxon deity around this time, it would be more appropriate to celebrate Hretha, of whom Bede places a celebration in March. Hretha has been all but erased in modern practice, and this is understandable, even reasonable, as we know nothing of her except for her name and a few hints that that gives. However, if there is an Anglo-Saxon goddess to be associated with the equinox, the evidence that we have suggests that Hretha would be more likely. Another thing that we need to discuss is the association between Eostre and bunny rabbits or eggs. Now, we usually use chicken eggs instead of rabbit eggs for the celebration, and that should probably be fixed, but let's move on. There doesn't really seem to be any historical attestation to this association, nor is there any ancient practice that we can discern as actually connected to Eostre. Easter eggs seem to have originated as a Mediterranean Christian tradition that moved north. The eggs were often painted red to represent the blood of Christ. If this was adapted from a pagan tradition somewhere along the line, it wasn't one associated with Eostre. There is a, a beautiful tradition of egg painting that appears in Slavic tradition, specifically associated with Ukraine, where ornately painted eggs adorn Easter celebrations associated with a pre-Christian tradition going back centuries that has been rolled into these Easter celebrations, and they are beautiful. Just look at them. However, this would be geographically distinct from those who celebrated Eostre, and a historical connection cannot be reasonably established. One might exist, but if it does, we don't know about it, and it's not something that is reasonable to assume. Now, that being said, these eggs are incredibly interesting, and unfortunately, there's more questions about them than answers. How far back does this practice go? We don't know exactly, but it seems to be pre-Christian. Christianity was introduced fairly late to the area, and its remoteness allowed for Slavic pagan traditions to survive for some time, just carried along with Christianity. In this case, through Easter. And that said, we don't really have ancient examples of them beyond little fragments here and there, which makes sense given how fragile eggshells are. But... There are, obviously, questions. Were the eggs drained to preserve their beauty, or was their temporal existence part of the magical point behind these eggs? Now, I'll, I'll just be straight up. I'm aware that many of my videos include, hey, 
here's an unanswerable question in history. Now, I don't know if this is something that like excites or frustrates y'all. I find myself kind of swinging between the two, leaning towards hating myself and everyone, fighting the urge to throw my history books against the wall and curse them, setting my house aflame in the process. But we don't know is a theme in history, and honestly, spirituality as well. I think that acknowledging this can humble us in our honest search through the faded fragments of the history of our religions. Now, there's definitely connections between eggs and fertility, and fertility has associations with spring celebrations, but that doesn't necessarily mean that eggs are associated with Anglo-Saxon spring celebrations. But what I could find was rooted within Slavic witchcraft, in which a hard-boiled egg worn on a necklace by a pregnant woman for 40 days would prevent a miscarriage. And while this practice is definitely of interest to those looking into historical symbols and practices associated with fertility, it's not exactly related to Eostre. Jacob Grimm even tries to make some association between Ostara and eggs, but he gives no evidence, and no evidence has been supplied since. Grimm just kind of says it. The, uh, the bunny rabbit thing is also interesting. Again, like the eggs, there's nothing really like wrong with it, but it's not something that we have historical attestation to. It was discussed as connected to Astara in the 1800s, but as a, a pontification, much like Grimm's egg association. Historians of the time seem to just look at bunnies and eggs and go, look, pagan. Uh, but without any reference to justify the assertion, other than it doesn't really seem to fit in with Christianity. Now, it's true that eggs may have come from some folk practice somewhere at some point, but the Easter Bunny seems to originate 1600s-ish, and while the Easter Bunny could be termed as a folk tradition, it's one that comes well after the introduction of Christianity. Bunnies, however, are reasonably associated with fertility, mainly through their immense skill at multiplication, hence the existence of math rabbit. Rabbits are, of course, able to multiply like, um, well, like rabbits. So, what do we do about this? What are some ways that we can develop a practice around the Ostre that is more historically informed? Well, let's take a look at the puzzle pieces. We have Bede saying that her celebration is during Eostermanoth during April, and we can connect that to Ostermanoth and Ostara. And from this, we can develop a goddess of the dawn. The reconstructionist would then look to adjacent cultures to see what we can find in celebrations around the same time with linguistic or cultural connection. From here, you can visit the idea of the Ukrainian tradition of egg painting, which have been rolled into Easter celebrations, but you can also look into the practices of the Romans, which have a greater wealth of record. The Roman goddess Aurora fits in linguistically with Ostara and Eostre, and she is the goddess of the dawn, making her especially interesting to someone reconstructing a conception of Eostre. Another goddess to look into might be the Roman goddess Flora, whose celebration Floralia was in April, and from here you might be able to find some ideas for celebrations and associations. Interestingly, it is here that we might be able to construct some association with hares through Floralia traditions. So everyone that wants to keep a, uh, an Eostre bunny of some sort as part of their celebration might find justification here. But that would be a justification for a modern practice, not necessarily a justification for a historical claim. Something that you might be able to say, however, is that one can reasonably associate Eostre with the awakening of land spirits in the spring as the winter thaw sets in and animals become more active. From there, you might be able to dig around and find some interesting aspects to incorporate into your practice relating to Astara or Eostre. From this examination, you may wind up with a fertility deity of the returning dawn, bringing warmth and renewal as spring settles in. She may be associated with a practice during sunrise, a ritual welcoming the dawn. She may manifest in nature as blooming flowers, chirping birds, and leaves returning to the trees. She may be associated with growth, fertility, renewal, and warmth. Her association with the dawn could bring her into a relationship with Sol or Sune. It would be reasonable to assume that there is a treasured friendship between these deities, even if we have no record or any story demonstrating the nature of that friendship. There's a lot to think about with respect to reconstructing and developing a practice or a tradition worthy of honoring Eostre. I hope I've um, helped. <laughs>
This is in large part the nature of discussing Anglo-Saxon gods. You wind up digging into linguistics and tugging at threads of history until you find something that might be useful in reconstructing a tradition. Anglo-Saxon heathens, as a result, are often acutely aware of the nuanced relationship between language, religion, and culture. And finding the nature of Eostre is but one example of this incredible yet often frustrating journey of linguistic puzzles and unanswerable questions. But with that, hail to my patrons for making this content possible. It's good to have people at your back. The like button has laid subscriber eggs that look suspiciously like bells. I don't know where else to go with that. Just uh, click the buttons for more heathen content. And remember to find a way or make one. Look, y'all just need to remember that Math Rabbit can fuck.